morning, everyone. There are just a few announcements. Um, the music committee is meeting after church, and anyone is welcome to attend. Oh, is it next Sunday? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Next Sunday. Um, and also, it's next week is also um, our outdoor service. And also a reminder that uh, we are putting together a book for pastors to help them put names, faces and names together. And um, um, Karen Matthews is going to be out in the Narthex after church. If you want your picture taken or you can send one in. So I think that's all I have.
once again. It's, it's good to be here. I, I bet, wow. <laughs> okay, we're in business now. Okay, I'll just do the, the service. Um, I'll, just, I'll do it here, okay? Thank you for your patience, and uh, we'll get that, we'll get that fixed, okay? So, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray. And you gladly give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us your abundant mercy. Forgive us those things that weigh on our conscience. And give us those good things that come only through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. 
the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please read responsibly. Psalm 138. Your steadfast love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward the holy temple and praise your name because of your steadfast love and faithfulness. For you have glorified your name and your word above all things. When I called, you answered me. You increased my strength within me. All the rulers of the earth will praise you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth. They will sing the ways of the Lord, that great is the glory of the Lord. The Lord is high, yet cares for the lowly, perceiving the haughty from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you keep me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the fury of my enemies. Your right hand shall save me. You will make good your purpose for me, O Lord. Your steadfast love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. The second reading is from Colossians. The writer of this letter warns the congregation in Colossae about the empty lure of philosophies and traditions that compromise faith. Through the gift of faith, the church is mystically connected with Christ in his death and resurrection, which is enacted in baptism. The reading. As you therefore have received Jesus Christ the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive to philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in him, who is the head of every ruler and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ, when you were buried with him in baptism, when you were raised with him through faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespass and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive altogether with him. When he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with his legal demands, he set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them triumphing over them in it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us prepare our souls for the gospel. Hallelujah. Ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Hallelujah. Before we read the gospel lesson here, first of all, thanks for helping fix the microphone. But uh, there's an interesting thing in the Old Testament lesson that probably uh, needs a little explanation. You notice that at the end, the Lord uh, protects God's people when there are ten present. And that, in Judaism, is the foundation of the fact that a congregation in Judaism is ten men. Okay? And, and that's part of that tradition in Judaism, that when they had that congregation together, it protects the people of Israel. Just a little kind of sideline to explain. It seems kind of strange to end on 10, so I thought I would share that with you. So. Now, the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, o Lord. 
and teaching his disciples this prayer. And it's a version of the Lord's Prayer, possibly an earlier version. Jesus also reminds them to focus on God's coming reign, God's mercy, and the strengthening of the community. Jesus encourages disciples to childlike trust and persistence in prayer. Here's the reading. Jesus was praying in a certain place. And after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend. And you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. For a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and get anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will give up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks, receives. And everyone who searches, finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks you for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Grace and mercy and peace be unto you. God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Father Barry Foster, who is a priest in Dublin, parked his car on a, a rather slow hill close to his church. Now he had his, his, his dog, his little Karen Terrier, lying in the rear seat, but, but nobody could see the dog from outside the vehicle. Now, Father Foster got out of his car, and he turned to lock the door of the car with his usual parting command to the dog. Stay! He ordered loudly to an apparently empty car. Stay! Now there was an elderly man who was watching the performance and, and kind of chuckling. And grinning, he suggested, Father, why don't you just try putting on the emergency brake? <laughs> Our subject today is prayer. And to the mind of an unbeliever, Watching someone pray is the equal of watching someone say, stay to their automobile. 
asking him to obey. But, because to an unbeliever, prayer is an exercise in futility. Why bother? But to the believer, prayer is the most powerful and the most reliable force in the world today. i got to repeat that. To the believer, prayer is the most powerful and the most reliable force in the world today. Now let's read the lesson. It's clear that Jesus believed in prayer. In fact, his disciples often observed him in communication with God. And that's why they asked him in our lesson here today to teach them how to pray. And Jesus gladly agreed to their request. And looking at what Luke tells us, we can divide, divide Jesus' formula for prayer into three parts. First of all, a pattern for prayer. And then secondly, persistence in prayer. And then finally, the payoff for prayer. Let me repeat those, because that's, that's kind of the outline for today. A pattern for prayer. Persistence in prayer. And finally, the payoff for prayer. So let's start out with a pattern for prayer. When Jesus' disciples asked him to teach them to pray, he gave them a model prayer. When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give each day our daily bread and forgive us our sin. For we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do, do not bring us to the time of trial. As I mentioned, this is in Luke, uh, probably an earlier version of the Lord's Prayer that we normally pray. Ours comes from the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, either way, Jesus is giving a pattern. It begins with the acknowledgement of who God is. And it re continues with a request that our daily needs will be met, that our sins be forgiven, and that we be delivered from the power of the tempter. And the implication here is that if you never pray another prayer, but pray this prayer with meaning every day, it would be sufficient. Jesus says, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be, and so on. I'm not going to ask any of you, how many of you pray an entirely different prayer every time you pray. It would be really a challenge, I think. If you were in prayer 365 days a year, you would have to come up with 365 totally different prayers. That is, if you said something different each time. Well, that practice, I suppose, is, is entirely possible. I'm not sure it's essential. God knows the desires of our hearts even before we mention them. The most important element in prayer may simply be the act of praying itself. Because prayer acknowledges our dependence on God. It acknowledges God's power and God's majesty and our own inadequacy and our need. The important thing in prayer is not what we say, but the fact that we take some time each and every 
every day to spend it in the presence of God. Now I know that, that it's fashionable in some churches to demean a ritual. And we all know what churches those might be. Even such rituals as the Lord's Prayer. Even though it goes way back to Jesus. Ritual, however, is very important to our lives, to yours and mine. You know, we all have certain rituals that we use when we eat, when we work, when we pray. Have you ever watched the kids basketball and they shoot free throws? Do the same thing over and over. Such patterns pay a very vital role in our lives. You know, I don't know if you know this, recent studies of alcoholic families show that children whose family have managed to maintain some rituals, maybe family dinners or regular bedtime routines, or celebration, they're less likely to become alcoholics themselves. Steve Wollin, who is a psychiatrist, has written a book on the subject, and he tells us that families who may be troubled in other ways as well, perhaps by divorce or a parent's mental illness, or the dispiriting effects of poverty. He says, rituals can be protective, even in families with severe problems. And you know also, and maybe you know this experience, because Lutherans do this, members of churches where well-known prayers are used frequently in the liturgy are greatly comforted by hearing those prayers in times of distress. Now I know that rituals can be abused. And if we're, we're not careful, they can even stand as a barrier to heartfelt and, and effective prayer. But don't worry for a minute if you find yourselves expressing yourself in new and original prayers every time you pray. But the important thing is to acknowledge our dependence on God, to confess our sins, and to request God's help with our daily needs. There's a pattern to prayer. Now secondly, secondly, Jesus is telling us that prayer is also a matter of persistence. Now here's one of the most intriguing parts of Jesus' teachings. And he gives us a hypothetical situation. Picture in your minds a friend that drops by unexpectedly. And you've got nothing to serve to eat. Now, nearby lives another friend. So even though it's midnight, you sneak over to the second friend's house and knock on his door, asking him to loan you some bread. That's what Jesus is saying. And at first, he ignores you. But you keep on pounding. Finally, just to get rid of you, he gives you the bread. Jesus said prayer is like that. Ask and you will receive. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. The key though is persistence. Persistence is powerful in every area of our lives. The Associated Press back in 
1999, carried a story about a, a young guy named Todd Ouellette, who was proof positive that one person acting alone can actually get the attention of the President of the United States. All you gotta do is walk across the country and camp in front of the White House day after day for 18 months. Stand at attention for hours at a time in the snow and rain and swampy summer heat. Kneel in, on the drizzle, sizzling cement concrete or march around the president's house with 50 pounds of rice strapped to your shoulders. Oh, that, by the way, happens now to be 55 years old. This is, this is, I just heard about this recently. Had been demanding action on behalf of American servicemen who were fighting in Vietnam and were still not accounted for. And he found that he was concerned about that and writing to his congressman didn't work. And he said, well, sometimes, he said with a shrug, sometimes you got to go to the man. Uh, he, his vigil finally did get President Clinton's attention, at least in writing and in discussions with presidential aides. Now, I know that Todd Ouellette's success was limited but the point is, in the article that I read, is that persistence did pay. And it de demonstrates for you and me that in our lives it will pray as well. Here's another example. Dr. Richard Anderson tells the story about the Lutheran Church in the former Soviet Union. I don't know if you knew this, I, I didn't. In 1928, there were 1.3 million Lutherans in the Soviet Union. And between 1928 and 1938, there were still 200 functioning congregations with 920,000 Lutherans and 98 pastors. In the latter 30s, a mounting communist persecution began against these Lutherans, obviously because they were Germans. And this was finally Hitler. And in 1937, the last two pastors were finally arrested. And the following year, the property of the last Lutheran church was confiscated St. Peter and Paul and, and St. Petersburg. And the Lutheran bishop on that day, his name was Arthur Meldrum, wrote to his people, he had written actually beforehand, the gospel shall remain and not perish, and not even the gates of hell shall destroy it. And then he also prophesied correctly, but our organized Lutheran church in Russia will disappear. And it did so for a time. It did so on the surface. It did so officially. Now here's the point underneath. It continued. The church had gone underground. Eugene Bachman, who was a labor camp survivor, started traveling around among former Lutheran communities in 1955 to kind of rally them together. And he found that there were still all sorts of congregations striving within homes quietly and unofficially. And within time, the Lutheran church gained official recognition once again. By 1974, the Lutheran World Federation representatives were able to travel through
through the area of the former secret bishop and discovered hundreds of existing congregations. And today that today that secret bishop is secret no longer. And you probably don't read a lot about it, but there is an evangelical Lutheran church in Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Central Asia. It's got about 24,000 members in more than 400 congregations. And its bishop is Dietrich Farah, who ministers to tens of thousands of Lutherans who never gave up, who prayed when it seemed useless, who persisted in the face of terror. Now, there's one other illustration that fits with it, that there was one person who did give up, who caved in to Soviet demands and communism's coercion. He was the son of a martyred Lutheran pastor. He was separated from his Christian mother as a youth. He was sent to Siberia and brutally treated. And he says, when I couldn't stand it anymore, I renounced Christ. I renounced my heritage, he said. I wanted to be part of my peer group. But you know, years later, he received his mother's last letter, written in a language that he no longer knew, was written in German, it was translated it for him by a friend, and he memorized it. This is what his mom wrote to him. I have no earthly possession to give you, but I will give you the best I have. Remember Jesus always. Follow Jesus always. Love Jesus always. He is your Savior, and you are loved by him. And that man cried, he said. I cried. And the voice of my mother led me back to the faith that I had denied. It must have been her persistent prayer, her daily petition to God while she was alive. Did God answer it? Well, today, he's a pastor of a Lutheran congregation in Russia. We think, you know, we think that if we pray once or twice or even three times, God ought to act. Many followers of Jesus have reported that they prayed for years, every day, offering up thousands of prayers before the fruits of those prayers ever become apparent. So we started out, there's a pattern in prayer, but the key is persistence. And then part three, finally, Jesus says prayer has a payoff. Now, I don't know, there might be some people who are offended using the word payoff. They sound kind of crass. But Jesus is as plain as he can be that if we are persistent in prayer, God will meet our needs. God is insistent that we can trust God. Now, I know the answer of our prayers may not be just the answer that, that we had prescribed. But God can be trusted. Our prayers will not go unheeded. 
It's like the little girl who crawled up on her father's lap while he was reading the newspaper and told him how much she wanted to, him to build for her a dollhouse. And she didn't climb down from daddy's lap until he promised to do just that. Although, in truth, he was a bit distracted and he agreed mostly because he wanted to be allowed to continue to read the newspaper. He forgot the promise until he walked into her room one evening and saw all her dolls and all the doll furniture packed up to move into the new doll house. And when he asked her about it, she simply told him that she knew he would be building that dollhouse, even though he hadn't begun it yet. Because, why because? Because he had promised her that he would. And that promise was good enough for her. And I don't know a better definition, friends, for faith. God has promised to heed our prayers. They will not go unanswered. Our part is to trust that what we receive from God is for our best good, even if sometimes we don't understand it. Through Christ, Jesus' words, is there anyone among you, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give you a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. As far as Luke's concerned, that's all we need to know about prayer books. There is a pattern of prayer. Effective prayer is often a matter of persistence. And prayer always has a payoff. God hears our prayers and responds to those prayers in accord with what is best for our lives. Because he wants us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love. Through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We continue with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. Amen. Trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. Rooted and built up in Christ, we pray for the church. Emboldened church leaders to take risks for the sake of the gospel and equip the baptized to proclaim your extravagant love for the whole world. Merciful God, Receive our prayer. Rejoicing in the works of your hands, we pray for the natural world. Make rivers and lakes, oceans and all waterways sparkle with your radiance. Protect water resources and strengthen those who defend them. Merciful God, receive, receive our prayer. Interceding on behalf of the vulnerable, we pray for the peoples of the world Inspire all rulers and governing authorities with your justice. Guide the work of legislators and public officials that they advocate for the well-being of those they serve. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Persistent in prayer, we pray for our neighbors in need. To all who have hunger, give daily bread. To all who have bread, give hunger for justice and healing. Open us to the cries of all who suffer among us, in our family, here at Zion. We especially pray for Sue Folly and Bob Knight and the family of Carol Cutchell. We pray for those in our community and throughout the world. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Abounding in thanksgiving, we pray for this congregation. Bless the prayer and fellowship ministries in this place. Call us together in times of praise and blessing, trouble and sorrow. In your holy name, merciful God, receive our prayer. Buried with Christ in baptism and raised with him to new life, we give thanks for your saints who rest in your eternal presence. Join our voices with theirs as we sing of your great glory. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love. Through Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. Amen. to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and prayers. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way 
of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
Thanks be to God. 